Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 12 of the Cashflow Joe podcast presented by Pips Path. I'm Pip Stelic, joined by my business partner, Sam Musa, Bradley Strack, and Steve Hipple. Sam, what's up? Always. Always. Bradley Strack, that's a weird guy over there. Bradley, how you doing today, my friend? Excellent. Steve, what's up with you? Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. So we are on the Cashflow Joe podcast to teach beginning investors how to do their first transaction. But we also want you as seasoned investors to be able to learn how to do more properties with more leverage and less of your own money and in a much safer way. So our company trains and mentors thousands of students all over the world to become successful real estate investors and how to really do this business from the very beginning. In fact, your personal, what do you call it, Bradley? Scorecard. Scorecard is on our website. And so you can actually go there, visit our website at pipspat.com where we have tons of resources and videos for you to watch, including, as Bradley just said, your personal scorecard and tons of other content. Now, we are actually on the additional second episode of wholesaling. We had just spent the last episode going through the first part of wholesale and where we had kind of, and just kind of give you a, a, a brief, grief, a grief, a brief background. I'll get it figured out here. I'll give you some grief as well. Give you a brief background. We talked a little bit about marketing and what you should be doing, a little bit about wholesale is. And we said marketing, you want to get people to call you. And so we are in the middle of when somebody calls you, what are you supposed to say? So Bradley and, and Sam have been going through this. Sam called Bradley on his We Buy Houses ad. So I'm going to let him pick up right where they left off on that script. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so we were uh, kind of role-playing here. And, you know, don't get that too confused, buddy. But uh, talking about a script for when we do... <laughs> And are looking for potential sellers in wholesale. So I'm talking to Sam here as if he has got a property to sell. I'm looking to buy his property. And I've just told him, uh, whatever you do, don't fix anything. I buy properties as is. And like we talked about last time, this is uh, going to excite the person on the other side of the phone here. This is going to excite Sam because he doesn't want to have to spend money to sell this property. Now, what we would do after that is... Uh, we are going to ask them, what is the least that you will take for the property? So, Sam, what is the least that you would take for your property? Well, I really wanted I wanted 400000 for it. 400000 yeah. So now here's what you're going to do. The next part of the script is you're going to repeat back the number that Sam has said or your seller has said because numbers can sound different, right? So 15 and 50 can can be very similar in the English language. So I'm going to say back to him, I'm going to say $400,000, and I'm going to say, hmm. Okay, so I'm going to say 400000 hmm, and then I'm going to shut up. Well, the realtor... See, said- and it's the first person to speak in a negotiation loses, right? And you see the awkward silence there. This is exactly what we want because what's now going to happen? He's going to either what justify his price or what we've seen before is he sometimes will even negotiate against himself. So he may say, well, I want $400,000 because I just put on a new roof. I just did some updating. Or he may say, well, I understand it does need some carpet and some paint. So the least I could take was maybe three eighty. He would. Say. Yeah, the realtor told me it was. You know, I mean, I could get four hundred. She thought, and uh, but you know, I obviously, I you know, I'm trying to get the most I can for it. I know there's some 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 repairs that have to be done to the property. So I mean, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be paying for a realtor. So maybe maybe could could you could you do three sixty? There you go. So at this point in time, whether he justifies his $400,000 price or whether Sam comes down and negotiates against himself to the $360,000 price point, the next step is always the same. And what we want to do is we want to get that property under contract. So we want to get that property under contract because we can then have our investors tell us if we have a good deal or not. And it doesn't matter if you know how to swing a hammer. It doesn't matter anything about this it doesn't matter if you have the money to buy the deal yourself the credit to buy the deal yourself because all we're doing is getting it on a contract we want to control the paper side of this deal so uh why we can do that as investors and we're going to have an episode where we go through talking about contracts uh 
sooner rather than later, but we're going to talk all about having different exits. So different addendums, different things that we place in our contract so that we can get out of that uh, if it's a deal that we're going to end up not taking to the finish line. But knowing we have control of the property through that contract without having to to always finalize the deal is very important uh, to the process of wholesaling. Yeah, and we, we split this up into two episodes. If you do want the script, just go to the site. You, you can get the full script uh, uh, so you can see it. Uh, Question, answer, question, answer. Uh, it's real simple. It takes you a few minutes. It's a few minutes uh, on the phone with somebody talking to them. Obviously, if, if it takes a little bit longer, they give you more information, that's great. The more information they give us, the better we understand the problem, uh, the more opportunity we can find a solution for it. And we want to, We always want to remember we're looking for problems. We solve problems. That's how we get paid. The bigger the problem, the bigger the paycheck. So you want to take this opportunity to understand this script and just walk through it, follow it, uh, and and practicing it will eventually it'll become yours. You'll become more comfortable with it, uh, but you just you just need to do it. So grab that script, take a look, uh, look it over. If you have any questions, obviously you can reach out to us. Well, and it's a very simple script, yeah. right? It's it's not complicated. We're just getting the the basic information that we need. There's some very basic negotiation skills built into that script. So uh, this is something, again, that I started out investing back in 2017. Uh, Steve, when were you a student again? It was 20... 2010. 2010, right? And and Pip, you were, was it 1950 or, or 1940 or so when you, you started out as an investor? I can't remember. 1931. They had houses then? Or yeah, was they, it like, yeah we, we were living in, in grass huts, but that's okay. You that's, could park your covered wagon out front, though. Of course, that's where I you know, hooked up the horse. Very nice, very nice. So, But this script has worked for years, and it's worked for all of us. It'll work for you guys, and, and again... It's getting you that information you need. What's that ace up the sleeve is. If somebody asks you a question you don't know the answer to, uh, and this is why you want to have and start building that community and that network of, of people is, say, my business partner takes care of that. Can I get with my business partner and get back with you? And, and that really is your, your get out of jail free card as you're starting out with a new investor. Then you come to a mentor like us. You say, hey, I got this question. Uh, can I do that? How can I do that? What is the answer? And, and you have somebody there to hold your hand and walk you through it. So great script to use uh, as you're starting out. And again, the only way you're going to get good at it is to practice. So don't be afraid to get on the phone and talk to some people. Yeah, that script is so powerful. It comes down to the end. What we're looking for is motivation. Is there any motivation with the seller? If if Sam said he wanted four hundred thousand dollars, and and then next you know he drops down to three ninety, three eighty, three seventy, three sixty, all in a conversation. We've we've had these conversations because a lot of times, especially sometimes for sale by owners, their price is a bit high, and they know it's a bit high. Or maybe the property's been in the market for a couple of weeks, couple of months, a longer. As Pip was saying in episode one. Of this, uh, the longer the property's been in the market, the more motivation the seller has to reduce the price. So if we, if you never ask, you never get. And that little simple little trick of when the when Sam said, "I want four hundred thousand dollars," and Bradley said, "Hmm," that one little trick has it works. It's such a silly little thing. Pip taught me that thirteen years ago, and I've used it dozens and dozens and dozens. Does it work every single time? No, of course not. But it's worked so many times when it does. Uh, it's just great because that negotiation. The ultimate goal in this is, uh, you know, to find some motivation from a seller. Get get some motivation if they if they drop the price, send them an offer, send them an offer on the property. People are like, well, I'm not ready to send an offer. If you don't send an offer on that property, somebody else may come along and swoop in and take that deal. So the sooner you make an offer, the more likely you get to negotiation, get that property under contract way before anybody else. A wise older gentleman taught me a long, long time ago. He says, if you're not making if you're not making offers, you're not making any money. Yeah, and, and I don't know who that wise older gentleman is, but they are very, very wise if they said that. And and all the stuff that we're talking about, and we're talking about, and Steve was just talking about putting it under contract, and I'm sure one of my partners here or myself here in just a minute, we'll talk about some of the things that you're going to put in the contract. So pre be prepared, gentlemen. If you don't, I may call on you to put what you want to need in that contract. We'll talk about assignment clauses and those kinds of things here in just a minute. But I do want to say this, uh, because we were just in Denver, and we offer all of our different trainings, all of our different subject matter in three-day live in-person classes that you can attend. So if, if, we're talking about this on a couple of podcast episodes. If you want three full days of training on this, 
we have the ability to do that at the path here. Uh, if you can't travel and you don't want to go to a three day live online class, you can do a, a six session, 18 hours worth of material uh, in a live online scenario based out of, on Zoom so that you can interact with our, our trainers. One of our trainers that teaches this, her name is Shelly, and in, 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 in her first year of being a property investor, she bought 96 properties. Is that good? Uh, it's <laughs> better than 95. Yeah. And, and I know that it's almost hard to even imagine that, but... When we she was uh, she was actually downsized from her job. That's what what drove her to get involved in real estate. So this is somebody who didn't have an income uh, uh, participating in real estate. I'm going to say 96 properties. Hmm, that's, that's that's still a lot. That's a ton. And so she, the reason she was doing wholesale is she didn't really have money, as Sam just said. And so you can do a lot of different stuff. I mean, and I can give you different scenarios on this. I have a brother. That that's all he does. Um, he and I got educated uh, back in two thousand and two, and he to this day he's a wholesaler, and and on an and on an average year he'll do thirty to forty wholesale deals, and that's all he does, and that's his business. And so you can make a living being a wholesaler if that's who you want. Another one of our trainers that uh, teaches for us, um, Cheryl. She's a realtor, and people think, oh my gosh, I'm a realtor, I can't wholesale, or I can't wholesale listed properties. Cheryl has been a wholesaler for, I'm, I'm going to say 14 or 15 years now. And, 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 and she got into wholesaling because she knew that she would have to put her kids through college. And so when you think about that and, and you realize, hey, there's a lot of expenses coming up, having an extra $5,000, $10,000, even hundreds of thousands of dollars per year of income because you know how to wholesale allows you to put more money in your pocket is it earned income? Do you have to do it over and over again? Yeah, definitely. But you can make a boatload of money, and you don't have to use money or credit to make it happen. And it should be it should be a strategy that everybody knows because we said this earlier. Every property should be considered first as a wholesale opportunity because you want to know how much money can I get now, and and that's what wholesale is all about: getting paid now, right? It, we're we're getting in and out of the deal. Uh, if we're making uh, a sizable amount more money than it would take, say, in a cash flow property. Uh, say it took me 10 years to get that same amount of money that I could get just by wholesaling it, I'm going to wholesale that property. I'm going to absolutely move that property out. So every single deal should be a wholesale deal. Most of our students start in that wholesale arena, mostly thinking by necessity, thinking they have to do it because maybe they don't have the capital. Regardless if you have capital or not, wholesale is a strategy that everybody should know. I've done wholesale deals for as little as $500. Uh, we just had a student close a wholesale deal that was over $120,000. Well, Bradley was just telling me that that he was thinking maybe we should we should look at that land deal that we got and maybe even consider wholesaling that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can definitely wholesale. That wouldn't be a wholesale deal because we already own it. Yeah, that's true. You're so we we, right. we bought point. it for a prop a Good price. Point. We're working on you know what are the processes to, to to build on it. If we could sell it for more than we bought it for, it's not technically a wholesale deal because we actually own the, the property. This is true. And so so this uh, would be a flip. That would be a flip, exactly. <laughs> and so when we look at this stuff, uh, we we need to think about it in a different manner. And wholesaling is one of those things that we can do. And so we, we offer wholesaling in multiple different ways to be able to learn this process. But in this podcast, what we want to do is take it to the next step. And uh, we, 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 let's say that we have an agreed upon price. What was the agreed upon price, Bradley, that you and Sam came to? $360,000. $360,000. Now, we need to have something in there called exit clauses. And an exit clause allows us to get out of that deal should we need to. If we can't find anybody to buy it from us for more than $360,000 and we don't want to hold it at $360,000, we need to find somebody that can buy it from us for more than three sixty, dollars or we're going to be able to exit the deal. And that can be multiple different time frames. Uh, we want to uh, you know, look at most real estate transactions and know that they usually complete in anywhere from probably 20 to 45 days. 30 days being a very common time frame. But here's what I want to think about. And then I'm going to have these guys and any of them can jump in and talk about an assignment clause and what that means and the right to show and view. Those are two of the things we want to talk about on this podcast. But I want you to think about it from the seller standpoint. I want you to think about it from if there's a realtor involved, the seller's realtor. If you had a realtor as the buyer, I want you to always think about this on time frames is that the, everybody in that real estate transaction wants the deal to get done as soon as possible. 
Because if you're the seller, you want to get paid as soon as you can. The realtor doesn't get paid until the property is closed, and the buyer's realtor and both the sellers, or I should say both realtors, don't get paid until the property is sold, and they then have to pay their brokers. So everybody in that real estate transaction wants to get that deal done sooner rather than later. So don't freak out. Don't be surprised as a new investor, even as an experienced investor, that everybody else wants the deal done quicker than you probably want to do. We want to go through some due diligence. We want to have enough time to find another buyer for the property that we can assign the contract to. Now, remember, we're selling the contract. We're not selling the property. We don't own the property. We have control of the property through the contract. So I don't know who wants to jump in here, but I'd like you guys, one of you guys to talk a little bit about assignments and what your new last name is going to be. Well, let me jump in and talk about what my new last name will be when I am writing any real estate contract. But it's true. Any deal that we do, we want to have the ability, because as Sam said earlier, is we're looking at any deal could potentially be a wholesale deal. So if we want to keep that as one of our exits, we always want to have uh, a couple of clauses in our contract specific to wholesaling property. Now, this is not uh, excluding any other uh, types of, of addendums we may add in there or clauses such as an inspection clause or partner's approval, financing, contingency, appraisals, things like that. But specific to wholesaling, uh, the first one we always want to have in there, and, and this will be everybody's new last name that's listening to this here on, uh, on the podcast right now is uh, and or designated entity. So when I'm signing a contract or putting my name or a corporation name on a contract, it's going to have my name, so Bradley Strack, and or designated entity giving me the right to assign that property to a corporation or another individual uh, before I take possession. And that's really what the assignment clause does is I'm able to take the contract that I have with Sam and I could then assign it for a fee to Pip as another investor who's going to pay me three hundred and sixty-five thousand for the property that we've got under contract with Sam for three hundred and sixty thousand. So at closing, I, as the middleman there, as the wholesaler, would make a five thousand dollar fee paid to me through an assignment contract that I have with Pip. And then he's going to take over and have to follow through with all those contract uh, rules and and dates and timeframes and everything else that I had in the original agreement with Sam. But now he becomes the buyer of that that property. So we as the investor want to have that assignment clause in every contract that we're doing. Uh, That's your new last name and or designated entity. The other thing you want to have is the right to show or view the property. So that's our second clause. That as wholesalers, we want to have that in there so that I can have a guy like Pip, another investor like Steve, come to check this property out while I've got it under contract. They can do their due diligence, and Steve may look at it to see, hey, is this a property I can rehab and flip for a profit? Steve. Uh, Pip may look at it and say, hey, is this a property I can turn into a short-term rental? Uh, But whatever that case may be, we want to have the right as the person holding the paper to show that property to anybody that may want to buy it off us. And and it's always uh, an assignment fee. It's never a commission. Commissions are exclusive to to realtors. So when we look at this, so so Bradley's got this contract that he's agreed to with Sam for $360,000. In there, it says Bradley Strack and or designated entity. And then it has in the conditions, the contingencies, an addendum, whatever you want to call it, there's going to be other exit strategies we'd put. But to keep it really simple for wholesaling, he's got an assignment clause that says he can assign it to somebody else or into a different corporation. And he also has the right to show or view. So that's what the contract look like, looks like right now. So what he's going to do is he's going to send this out to his buyer's database. Or if he doesn't have a buyer's database, he's going to be building a buyer's database using this property. So guys, what are some ways that we could build a buyer's database that you guys have seen over the years that you've done in your businesses? What are some ways that we could build a buyer's database? Lots of ways. Building a buyer's database. I'm old school. I've always done face-to-face networking. There's lots of Zoom virtual meetups you can go to. Wherever you meet people, one-on-one, face-to-face, virtually, 
ask them what they're looking for. Just say, hey, you know, my name is Steve. I'm a, I'm a wholesaler. I'm a real estate investor. Sometimes I come across properties in my business that don't fit my qualifications, don't quite fit what I'm looking for. Now, maybe it's too far away from where I invest. Maybe the property is too big, too small, too expensive. Maybe I just don't have any money to buy this property, so it doesn't fit my criteria. Could be any number of reasons why it doesn't fit my criteria. And so I may bump into a real estate investor. Maybe I bump into Sam. And uh, he's at a, at a real estate investing club. And I say, Sam, are you looking for more properties? He says, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, well, if I came across a property that met your criteria, would it be okay if I send it to you? And so right away, I've got, a, I've got a real estate investor who's trying to add to his portfolio. He wants to buy more properties. So at that, I'm going to get Sam's, Sam's business card or his contact information. I want his name. I want his phone number. I want his email. And I'm going to add him to my, my buyer's database. I'm going, to, I'm going to go around that room or that networking event. I'm going to get all the, all the contact information I possibly can. I can do it at live events. I can do it at virtual events. I can do it at, uh, at, the, at um, what am I thinking of, um, really? auctions. At, community, at auctions, at properties. They put a property for sale at an auction because who's at an auction? People at an auction are buyers. They're people that want to buy a property at an auction. When do you have to pay for the property? You pay for it now or 30, 60 days? At an auction, you need cash. You need money. You're pre-approved for financing. So at, at auction, or real estate investors already have the financing in place. So I want to get business cards for them. I want to add these people to my buyer's database because they're investors and people want to buy more property. So that's just a couple of ways that you can add people to your buyer's database. But you know, people always say, well, do I, do I start looking for properties first? And I say, yes. Or do I build my buyer's database first? Yes. You got to do both because if you've got a property but no buyers, you know, you're not, you're going to have a hard time finding buyers. Or if you got a, if you got buyers, no property, your buyers would be like, well, where's your property? Where's your properties? Just build both. When you're new, work on your buyer's database and getting properties under contract. And everybody's in real estate, right? Uh, everybody's a buyer, seller, renter, owner, investor. Everybody around you is involved in real estate. And I think the great thing you can do is write someone's name down, identify them as a buyer, seller, renter, owner, or investor, and find out if there's a, a problem that you could solve for them. Someone might uh, be a renter and wants to become an owner, and that's an opportunity for a rent to own. Someone might be a seller, and there's your opportunity for a wholesale deal. So you want to look at everybody around you and identify them. Are they a buyer, a seller, a renter, an owner, an investor? Everybody, typically everybody around us is involved in real estate. And as Steve said, if I give Steve my contact, how great is it that I have somebody out there, another person looking for for a property for me. He's, he's basically a bird dog for me. And if he has the ability to send me deals from my home, just sitting at home and deals are coming to me and I get the opportunity to jump on them, that's a great opportunity for, for, for me to, to, to build my real estate portfolio by having other people uh, and working with other people looking for properties for me. Lots of different ways to do it. Two other ones. One is calling for rent signs. Bradley, you're the script guy. Do you have, you, do you have your script ready for calling for rents? You want me to do that? I can do it. Yeah, so you could call for rent, and just a quick script on that. I'm going to let Bradley jump in and do a quick script. Then I'm going to talk about a built-in buyer's database that we already have for you here on the path. Can we, can we have Sam do the phone voice again? Sam, go ahead. You can do the phone. I love this. <laughs> all right. So we're let's, back let's We're back that. onto the role oh, play no, here, not all actually, right, buddy? Like he went bring, 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 bring. Oh, bring, bring. Sorry. There you go. Oh, that's, his, that's his phone. Uh, no, bring, bring. You're... you're Oh, my phone's ringing because you're calling me. Okay, <laughs> exactly. Am, so, am well, the, well, let the, me let me preface this here. So guy. this is this is us calling a for rent ad. And and before I give you the script, let me talk a little bit about why we want to call a for rent ad. But uh, you've hear, heard us talk a lot about different types of investing and and different strategies to use. And you don't hear us talk a lot about flipping. You don't hear us talk a lot about doing single family rentals because. Many of us don't want to be the, in that landlord status, right? So, so fixing toilets, dealing with tenants and trash, and uh, why we call for rent ads is we believe that a lot of times the owner of those rental properties could be what we like to call a tired landlord, and uh, if they haven't been using systems and a team, then they may have bought themselves another job, and so they're working 40, 50 hours a week. Now they're chasing rents, trying to keep up with a property, and and they just want to get it out of their hands because they didn't they didn't do their due diligence before they even got into the deal. It was more work than they thought. They tried to do it on their own, uh, and now they're they're just getting trying to get away from it. So, uh, uh, for rent ad is a great place to call uh, to look for potentially a tired landlord that 
hey, maybe they want to participate in a deal with us. Maybe they want to do seller financing. Maybe we can do some interesting things because they're a fellow investor. Or uh, if they're not looking to sell a property, then maybe there's somebody that we could be wholesaling properties to. If, if I call a for rent ad that Steve has up, uh, and it's it's uh, a property down here. Let's say it's in Delray Beach where I live. Uh, and Steve's an investor down there. Well, I call him and ask if he wants to sell a property. He says, heck no, man. I love owning property. In fact, I want more. Well, you know what, Steve? Could you tell me what kind of properties you're looking for? You know, what price range? What zip code? What do you use them for? Is it short-term rentals? Is it long-term, mid-term? Whatever. But now I can use these for rent ads as, as great ways to build either buyer's database or uh, a, a database of potentially properties I could do some some creative financing on to own myself. So for rent ads are a great place to start making phone calls. And so we'll say Sam has an ad up on Craigslist. He's got a property for rent. Uh, it's currently vacant. So the first thing I know in my head is if that guy's got a vacant property listed on Craigslist, it's costing him money every day, right? I got a problem. Those yep, taxes and problem. insurance yep. are still coming out, yep. whether he likes it or not. So uh, he's got a problem. So I'm going to call him up on the phone, I'll say, hi, this is Bradley. I'm a real estate investor. Are you the guy that has the three bedroom, two bath house for rent? I do. I do. And my name was Bradley. What was your name again? Sam. Sam, would it be okay if I ask you a couple questions? Absolutely. You guys seeing how this script is kind of similar to the one we used before? It's not a different script. It's the same thing, right? And so I'm going to ask Sam now, and this is where it changes up a little bit. He's got the house for rent. He says, yes. Sam, would it be okay if I ask you a couple questions? He says, yep. yes. If he had told me no, how much time have I wasted going out and trying to look at Sam's house? None. So it's also doing these things methodically so we're not buying ourselves a 40 hour a week job. We're making phone calls. We're having things so that in five, four or five hours per week, I'm getting results because I'm asking the right questions and I'm talking to the right people. So at this point, I'm going to ask him, Sam, I'm actually not interested in renting your home. I'm interested in buying it. Would you like to sell? Yes or no. Hmm. Would I like to sell? Hmm. Yes or no. Hmm. You know, uh, yeah, you, you know what? I, I might want to sell it. Boom. There you go. So let's take that answer. Let's take that answer. So he says, yes, I want to sell it. Now I'm going to ask him what he's looking for. Does he need cash up front? Does it need work on the property? All that same script we had from before. I'm going to get all that information, get it under contract, run my comps, have my contract filled out correctly, and then we can see if there's a potential deal there. But let's say that he says no. No, so I, say, I, I, I don't want to sell. Do you, do you want to rent? Don't, don't you want to rent it? Well, you know, we'll get into another podcast where I will talk about why I want to rent your house, and I'm going to still use it as a, as a short term rental or an Airbnb. But for right now, no, I don't want to sell. I like, I like, I like the property. He doesn't like want to sell. Yeah, I don't like it. That's great. What other kind of properties, Mister Investor, do you like? Properties like the one I have in the same area would be wonderful. So now I'm going to my, and it could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to go to my Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to add Sam as a potential buyer. And I know he wants duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes within this zip code in Delray Beach. And he's looking to spend between half a million and a million bucks on those properties. Now, if I don't have anybody else in my database, what kind of properties do you think I'm going to go start making offers on? Yeah, it's great knowing Those. what 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 the person's looking for because instead of just getting properties under contract and, and moving it to your buyer and seller's database, which is fine, right? To your buyer's database, um, it's great having people who are waiting on you to get them a specific type of property. So you can focus your energies on a particular area, a particular type of property, a price range. The more detail we get. Uh, from the potential buyer, the more we can hone in on and put our energy towards finding the right opportunity for them, solving their problem. Well, many times we will will see that in that conversation, uh, you know, they may say, "Well, I, Sam could say I like these duplexes, triplexes. I like the long term rentals, but I got to buy them in at least a 
10% discount. I want to make a little equity in the buy. I want to make some money when I buy the property. So I need a, a 10% or so discount. So now if I'm going to go out and look for potential properties that he wants, I'm making offers at a 20% discount, a 25% discount, because if I can get them to agree to a 20% discount, a 15% discount, he said he only needed a 10% discount for his business. So now I can bring him a deal that's a discount and it looks good on paper to him to what his use will be, but my fees build into that. So I can make the difference between on that $400,000 house, that could be $20,000. And it needs to be a deal, right? You need to be to able be. to give a deal to, to, to the potential buyer. Both of us need to win yep. if we want this transaction to go through. So yep. the first question I, I am thinking on calling these four rents is I need to find out what problem this guy or this other investor may have so that I can find a way to solve that problem. That's awesome. And, and, and those are all different ways that you guys can find and build your buyer's database. I'm going to give you two more real quickly. If you don't have anybody in your buyer's database, you can take the property that you have under contract and you can market that contract on Facebook Marketplace. You can market it on Craigslist and people will call you on that ad. And so it's kind of like fishing. The only time to catch a fish is when you have your line in the water. And so get that property out there. If nobody wants to call you on it, if nobody wants to pay you more than you have it under contract for, we're going to use those exit clauses that we have in the contract to get out of the deal. If somebody calls you and they don't want that property, what can you do? You can ask them, what are they looking for? What types of properties? What areas? What price point? And can I get your contact information? If I find something that fits your situation, I now can have put, put them in my buyer's database. But the best and the easiest way for you guys to build a buyer's database has become part of Pip's Path RIA. And we talked about RIA on one of the one of our other episodes. And that is a community of like-minded people that are out there buying properties, that are out there investing in deals. If you have questions on how to get into that, obviously you need to go to our website at pipspath.com and we can help you with that. But we've got a built-in database of thousands of students already that are already qualified to buy properties. They're qualified to do all kinds of different things and they're a community of like-minded people that wanna help each other out want to help us create win-win situations for everybody. So this has been part two of wholesaling. And so next episode, what we're going to talk about is how to work with a realtor. In fact, we'll talk about how we work with them to make it mutually beneficial for them and us because the realtor, to get, realtor gets paid when we get the deal. And that's what they want to do. They want to get paid. We want to buy more properties. We're going to talk about what questions we can ask them and how we get the right realtor on our team. But before we get out of here, like always, I just want to say again, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you wish. For more information on us, go to our website, pipspath.com. Lots of different tools on there you can use. Get to get, get to know us. We'll get to know you. Or follow us on social media at Pips Path the Property and Cashflow Joe Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and on TikTok. Leave us a comment. Give us a follow. And we look forward to seeing you on the path.